the Mishcon Academy Digital Sessions. Welcome everyone and thank you so much for joining us today for this Mishcon Academy session, part of a series of events, videos and podcasts looking at the biggest issues faced by businesses and individuals today. I'm Sarah Lau, Communications Manager at Mishcon Dureya. It's my absolute honour today to introduce our guest, Jarvis Cocker. A musician and broadcaster, Jarvis formed the band Pulp while at school in Sheffield in 1978, which went on to become one of the UK's most successful groups, producing some era-defining anthems along the way. Jarvis's musical output also spans scoring the recent series This Is Going To Hurt with his band Jarvis and collaborating with Wes Anderson on his recent film, The French Dispatch. He's also known for his beloved BBC Six Music program, Jarvis Cocker's Sunday Service, which ran from 2009 to 2017. However, he's most recently turned his attention to perhaps his most ambitious creative project yet, a loft clear out. <laughs> This significant undertaking forms the basis for his new book, Good Pop, Bad Pop, and we are delighted that he's able to join us today. Please welcome Jarvis. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Hello. Welcome. Could you explain the central premise of the book for anyone who's not familiar? Somebody's trying to get in, I think. <laughs> Desperate, too. We're just expanding yeah, the room. There's too many people who want to join us. Well, as you say, you, you kind of introduced it perfectly. Um, I, there was a, there's a house in the east end of London that I lived in at one point, and I'd left a lot of stuff in the loft of this house. Some of it was stuff that I'd brought down from Sheffield with me years and years before. Other stuff was less thought out. It would be like if my mum was coming to the house and it was really untidy, I would just like <laughs> run around the house grab it all and just chuck it into this loft. It was like, oh yeah, I've really got it together. My life's together. Um, so it was all there. Then I, I kind of moved away from London. I went to live in France. I got married, all this kind of, you know, grown up kind of thing. And uh, the stuff just stayed there, gathering dust. Um, and I always thought, I mean, I suppose everybody probably has something like that. It might not be a whole loft, it might be a cupboard, it might be a coat that's just like stuffed with bits of paper or whatever. It's like, I, think, I kept thinking, well, you know, I'm, I'm going to, one day I'm going to go through that stuff and see if there's anything useful or, or whatever. Uh, but I never really got around to it. And then eventually, three or four years ago, I, I, I did start getting around to it. And something made me rather than do the sensible thing, which would be just like ring a skip and say, uh, I'm just going to be chucking lots of stuff out of a window, <laughs> just put it below. I, I kind of thought, because I thought there was something there, or the, there was the potential that there was something there, that I, uh, I thought, well, okay, I'm going to look at every single thing that's in here and take a picture of it, and then I'll decide what I'm going to do with it. And um, as, as I kept doing that, um, <laughs> it, it, it kind of dawned on me that actually I was looking at a bit of a, of a life story because these things had kind of, they are, there were things that I'd kind of accumulated. I wouldn't say collected, but I'd, I'd just kind of accumulated them over the years. And so they triggered memories. I mean, sometimes it would take ages. I'd look at something and go, what the hell is that doing there? You know, what is that? Who would hold on to something like that, you know? For instance, there's a piece of soap. There's a, there's a piece of uh, imperial leather soap, uh, which basically is just the label of the soap with a tiny bit of soap attached to it. I think it's, you know, um, did I ever get washed up here? <laughs> why, why is that there? And then, I, and then when I looked at it a bit longer, I remembered that sometime in maybe the early 90s, Imperial Leather changed the label design on their soap. This was a major problem for me. <laughs> and um, I hated the new label design. So I, I would go to shops and um, kind of really feel towards the back of the, of the shelf and find one, you know, the old design on it. But after a couple of months, you know, the new design was everywhere. And this, this little fragment that was left was like the last one with the original design label on it 
and when I got to the end where you just could not use it anymore because it was basically just label, not much soap left, uh, I, I kept it. So, you know, that's, I mean, that's kind of terrible, isn't it? I mean, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it must say something about me as a person, but it's not a particularly good thing, I don't think. So, so that's, you know, so stuff like that, I did realise that it was, these things were telling me something about myself. In the book, you explore the idea that we kind of shape and reshape stories for ourselves and, and tell ourselves versions of stories or critical moments from our life. So was there anything that you found challenging uh, as you were uncovering items and thinking about particular memories or anything that you were surprised by? Yeah, I mean, I think that's why I was kind of relieved in a way that I found this particular way in to to write in a memoir, I guess. I, I had, you know, people had asked me over the years, are you ever going to write a memoir? And I always kind of resisted the idea. I think coming to it from this direction made it different because, as you say, if I'd have sat there, you know, in a well-upholstered chair, and I mean, I'll just think about my life now, <laughs> cast my mind back. I would remember different things. I would, I would, I'm, I'm, I would be viewing it from here where I am now, so I'd, I would embellish it according to what I thought had happened. But sometimes objects would actually tell me something happened you know, in a way that I didn't remember correctly. You think that the past is a fixed thing. You know, you, you think, well, that's done, that happened, so that's a fact. That's solid, like a, like a plinth that I'm standing on. But, um, but it's not. When you actually start to, to examine the past, it gets very slippery and strange. Um, I wanted to ask you a question, and maybe this is slightly cheeky because you warn against it specifically in the book, about uh, delving too much into the creative process yeah, and asking yeah. people about their creative process. Yeah. Um, but you also gave me a get out of jail free card uh, in describing your experience with Leonard Cohen, which is just throw to the audience for questions. Mm. So we might be turning to the audience sooner rather than expected, depending on how this pans out. <laughs> okay, okay, go on, fire, uh, fire away. <laughs> what I was curious about was you, in, in terms of your musical output, you've collaborated with so many different people, in fact, just across the course of your career. and. I wondered whether, do you find that your creative process changes depending on who you're working with and who you're collaborating with? Yeah, <clears throat> for sure. I, th I think that's, in some ways, that's the point of collaborating, you know, um, because it can show you a different way of how people do it. I think you evolve your own way, you kind of stumble into ways of working, especially if you work with a group, which is where you kind of, you all have to adapt to each other's kind of strengths and weaknesses. And, um, you know, the drummer might tend to play a bit fast. They always do. <laughs> so you have to keep up with them. But that gives it a sound, you know, that, that, that you couldn't get from a computer or something like that. Um, and then, yeah, so you, you, you get it so you, it kind of works for you. And then you'll go and see somebody else doing it. Like, I was flabbergasted once we were in um, Townhouse Studios, which for, sadly is, is gone now in London and we were working on a record, and in the next studio next to us, Elton John was there. And it turned out that Chris Thomas, who was producing us at the time, had worked with Elton John, so he, he introduced us to him. And then um, we went into the studio, and, and he just had like some words, you know, on the music rack where, the, where uh, on a piano, he just got the words, some words there. And, uh, and apparently the way he writes the song, you know, is it, uh, Bernie Taupin or whoever is working with him will send in the words, puts them on the thing, and then he goes, dun, 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 and he, he kind of reads it and puts music to it as he's doing it. And I thought, oh, how can you do that? <laughs> it's like, because for me, my whole career, a very consistent thing has been, we'll struggle to come up with a piece of music that we're happy with, and then the words are totally the last thing, and often like, the night before we're going in the studio, it'll be me staying up like, <laughs> trying, to, trying to write, trying to get it done, you know. And so the idea that somebody would start from the words and actually be able to read words and think of them, how music would go with them. That would, so 
you're always learning from people that you work with. I didn't work with Elton John, but uh, you, you, you learn from seeing how other people do it. Yeah. Do we have any questions in the room? For a room full of lawyers, um, the hero of your life story is obviously Bob Mortimer. Um, have you got any souvenirs of that episode that you might put in the book, or is it an episode you, you, you've tried to uh, forget? No, well, you're referring to an incident that happened in 1996, but um, where Bob Mortimer, having got a bit of a legal background, step, uh, came to my aid, uh, which I will always be grateful to him for. Um, that doesn't get mentioned in this book, no, because chronologically this book kind of stops in 1985. Um, sorry. <laughs> uh, but uh, I'm sure if I do decide to write another book and we move into that time, I will definitely talk about that for sure. Yeah. I did see a really lovely review which said that the person said they hoped you had enough tat left to write a second volume. <laughs> so that's... I don't have to worry about <laughs> about, about running out of tat. I mean, a lot, a lot of other things in my life I can worry about, but that not that one. Excellent, an endless supply. Uh, we've got a question from Helen, which is coming online. Uh, looking good, Jarvis. Any tips? That's not a question. <laughs> that's, just, that's just like a really lovely statement. <laughs> Well, the, the second part to it is any tips. Any tips? Be, I don't know. I, I, well, I, I, I do feel okay at the moment. So thank you very much. And um, I haven't got any kind of like, I'm not sponsored by any products or anything like that. Uh, you have to stay interested in life. I know that sounds kind of like I've read that on the back of a cornflake box or something. But, um, yeah, you've got to kind of, uh, I, I am curious. I think that's something that keeps you excited by life. You know, I mean, there's a lot of stuff going on that can really disgruntle you. Um, and you just got to kind of not ignore that, but just there's so many great things in the world to find and discover and to be stimulated by. Just seek them out. That would be my advice. Are there any particular pairings that you would recommend in terms of something that's made you particularly disgruntled and then something that's offset that? Well, I, know. I mean, just general public life is pretty... <laughs> I mean, we've got monkeypox on the horizon now. <laughs> which I wish they wouldn't show you pictures of, like, what it can do. I mean, it's like... <laughs> um, so, you know, obviously stuff like that is, is not a great vibe. Um, but I think you know. But I think that's the thing. There's a there is a slightly more serious point, I suppose. As in, um, like yeah, like I went and did a tour of the west coast of America maybe four years ago, and that was the first time I was going back to the USA since Donald T. I can't mention his name either, just like Margaret T. Um, and I just thought you know because I'd. I'd um, <clears throat> obviously watched news and, and stuff like that. I thought, what's it going to be like being in America? Uh, I was kind of, yeah, a little bit worried about going. And, um, and I went and it was fine. You know, it was, you do, you've got this feeling sometimes that there are like two worlds. There's the world that kind of jumps out at you from a laptop or, or your phone or whatever, which is always going to be this kind of like apocalypse imminent. Mm -hmm if not actually happening right now. Um, and then the actual world that you walk through and you know, just meeting people, an unmediated experience, which was very pleasant. And I think you have to keep that in mind, that things only really sell if they're like apocalyptic. <laughs> and that's not actually the experience of real life. What sort of interactions with common people do you think Yanis Varoufakis's wife would like to have? Um, well, you're talking about, yeah, you're talking about, uh, she's the wife of the ex-Greek finance minister, right? Yeah. Correct. Yeah, well, there was a rumour going round a few years ago, it was even printed in The Guardian, I think, uh, that she was the actual, she came from Greece, she had a thirst for knowledge, that she was that person. Um, 
it was unfortunate that they didn't ask me that before they actually <laughs> printed the article because I could have told them categorically that she isn't. Damn. Yeah. Because uh, and I couldn't understand where it came from because she did study sculpture at St. Martin's College and she's Greek. <laughs> So, you know, but as you will know, as lawyers, that doesn't make a case, does it really? <laughs> that could be just a coincidence. And, and the thing was that um, the person who I wrote the song about, I met her, um, well, let me backtrack a bit. Um, St. Martin's College, at that point, I don't know if they still do this, but uh, in your second term in the first year, they would send you off on this thing called crossover, which was that you would do another discipline for two weeks, which I thought was a really nice idea. So I was studying film, and they gave you, like, what do you want to do? Do you want to do painting? Do you want to do that? And I thought, oh, sculpture, I'll, I'll have a go at that. So I'd signed up for that, and this woman that I met uh, and ended up writing the song about, was doing the same. So she wouldn't have been studying sculpture at St. Martin's <laughs> College, but it wouldn't scan if I went, she was doing crossover for two weeks. <laughs> I can't, I can't not, it would, wouldn't really work as well. So I took a bit of artistic license and, and changed it. And that, I think that's where the mix-up has come from. I'm not sure where to start. This has been brilliant. And I know and can say on behalf of the audience that we are so excited and so happy that you've been able to join us today. I think you've shared some really wonderful things about the book and it is an incredible read. And we're really grateful that you were able to join us today. So please join me in thanking Jarvis Cocker. Thank you. The Mishcon Academy Digital Sessions. To access advice for businesses that is regularly updated, please visit mishcon.com. <laughs>